Today is Tuesday, September 15th, 2015. I'm Joe McMaster, and as part of the MIT Infinite History Project, we're talking with Henrietta Davis. Ms. Davis is a former mayor, city councilor, and school committee member for the city of Cambridge. Ms. Davis has lived in the Cambridgeport neighborhood of Cambridge since 1969. Among her many accomplishments during her career in city government were the Cambridge Compact for a Sustainable Future and the Net Zero Action Plan. <clears throat> She's been an advocate for non-auto transportation, public health initiatives for children and seniors, energy efficiency as a tool to combat climate change, and as an advocate for preserving open spaces in neighborhoods, just to name a few. Ms. Davis has a bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester, a master's degree in social planning from Boston College Graduate School of Social Work, and a master's degree in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Thank you for speaking with us, Ms. Davis. Nice to be with you. So you and MIT go way back, I gather. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I've been here since the end of the 60s, as you noted. Um, and in uh, 19, the early 1970s, I went to social work school at Boston College um, and uh, enrolled as a, in community, or community organizing and social planning and uh, had the option of cross-registering with other local institutions. So I took my basic social work classes and community organizing classes at BC, but I took a number of classes at MIT, really important classes uh, for me um, as a... Uh, as a public person, as a public policy person. Uh, for one thing, I took a fabulous city planning class with Kevin Lynch, who was, you know, one of the icons of city planning for all people everywhere. Um, I took a class with Rob Hollister in uh, uh, city services. I took a class on planning law with Bill Doble. Um, I had great classes here. I really enjoyed it, and uh, uh, it augmented what I was doing at BC um, tremendously well, not to mention that it was a shorter commute since I live in Cambridgeport. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you you uh, lived in Cambridgeport, as we noted, since 1969 in well, the same actually, house? Well, actually, 67. I, oh, 67. In yes. the same house I read <laughs> somewhere. I don't know if that's true. Well, it's in the same house since 1969. I rented from MIT. I forgot. I rented from MIT. MIT owned that property, and along with a lot of other property um, in my block, I think it was uh, 16 or 17 houses in one block, and MIT intended at some point to turn it into faculty housing. It was going to be a faculty green, and um, they were able to acquire the property because of the inner belt, the shadow of the inner belt on the Cambridgeport neighborhood. Um, so I lived there first as a, as a tenant, and then... Um, I don't know who was advising them, but they put all these properties on the market at once. Well, you know you're not supposed to do that, right? Because if you do that, then the price gets depressed. And lucky for me, it did. And I bought this two-family house that I've been living in ever since. So uh, thank you, MIT, for that, for giving me a home. And, uh, um, and yeah, so I've been there. And at first, I was there with roommates. And uh, eventually, I got married and had children, and our family grew up there, and now it's my husband and myself are uh, empty nesters with a dog. <laughs> so you've probably seen a lot of change. Um, oh, what, yeah. What's it been like, and what's sort of your early memories of MIT? Maybe it goes back even before registering here as a student. I don't know. Well, no, it was, it was only a few years before then. I mean, yeah, um, uh, now my, fir my first uh, probably relationship was really was the house that I was living in, you know, so that um, what was his name? I forget his name. Uh, who was the who represented the the landlord who was MIT? That was my from my first connection. But I don't think that was terribly significant. Um, I don't know. I don't. You know. I think it was over there. It was more over there than it is now because obviously the campus has grown and gotten closer and closer to uh, uh, to the neighborhood. It wasn't quite as close then. It was on the other side of the railroad tracks and. Uh, uh, so I think really my first encounter was at pretty much as a student, although there was a lot of uh, turmoil already because of the purchase of uh, the Simplex site, which I don't know if you've gone into this in some of your other conversations, but uh, MIT bought uh, the Simplex Wire and Cable Company, and uh, which is now the site of University Park. And in the neighborhood, there were lots of conversations and dreams about, you know, what should become of all this uh, land. Um, uh, it should all, of course, become a park. That's what I learned when I was an elected official, that every time land becomes available, it should become a park. Well, you know, that doesn't happen. But um, 
there was a um, there was another MIT class which I can't remember. Maybe I did register for it called Ecolog, which was a, a, a planning a participatory planning class in which we sort of took on uh, what would be the future of this huge site. Uh, that MIT had bought, and the hopes and dreams of the neighborhood, again, including all those, all the parkland that should be there. And <clears throat> how did it work out? Did it, did it, well, I oh, know how terribly. it's simple, but it didn't work, <laughs> did it, it didn't work out as you Well, guys I mean, Ecolog, well, Ecolog became, it, it turned out to be a focal point for a lot of, uh, a, a lot of conflict, because the dreamers thought, well, and of course, we should have our way, and uh, some of us were not quite so dreamy, but we still probably had wishes. And, uh, and so it became a point of conflict for poor MIT who had this class that was like not working in their, in their interests. Um, so at the time, I, it was uncomfortable as a neighbor to be with other neighbors who felt somehow that they had the right to determine what the university would do with its property. I guess that makes me sort of conservative in a, in a Cambridge sense, but I mean a few things, but That's the whole thing? <laughs> Right. Yeah. No. I guess then. I guess that issue went on for quite some time. Oh yes, so. it certainly did. Yeah. It certainly did. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you uh, did you originally plan to go into politics, or did you have other things in <laughs> mind originally, or? Well, that kind of happened at, uh, at at MIT also because in this Bill Doble class that I took on planning law, he did an exercise and he said, "Picture yourself in uh, twenty years. Where will you be?" and it wasn't until I sort of did that free writing that I realized that I was interested in politics. And um, even though I had done kind of volunteer work when I was in high school in Newton uh, on campaigns, I didn't really intend to go into politics. And when I went to social work school, I didn't think I was going to do that. Uh, it wasn't actually until um, my kids were born and I thought a lot of these other things don't work with children how about something that's sort of more amorphous in terms of the time, like working all the time instead of just part time? Um, and so, uh, working for the city, working as working as a school committee member made sense. Plus, I had, of course, the interest in what the schools were going to be like for my kids. Right, right. <clears throat> but you started out actually, uh, I believe, in in journalism and even some other fields. Maybe. Well, I started off as a planner for the city. Ah, that was okay. my first job. Okay. I was a neighborhood planner. Um, sort of really following up on the MIT part of my social work career, I ended up actually in city planning. And I worked there for a few years and then did um, some social service planning. And uh, then the market fell away, and um, as it sometimes does, and uh, what was left but journalism, which I, I loved doing. It was really a lot of fun. I uh, did radio and a lot of radio pieces. I had a column in the Herald, and I wrote for the Globe, and I had, was a, the uh, New England stringer for Money Magazine. I was a stringer for Time. I sort of had like a whole bunch of little non, almost non-paying gigs that somehow kept me together. Right. Somehow almost added up maybe to a paying gig. <laughs> well, as long as Richard was working, as long as my husband worked, I could do that. <laughs> so then somehow you came back to, uh, to politics, I guess, right? Well, uh, I was working uh, as a running a daycare center, actually a parent cooperative, which is extremely democratic. You know, everybody gets at least one vote, um, two votes out of each household. Very small, you know, only 35 kids, but 70 adults who had, had a say. So I, part of my, uh, my job was kind of run that democratic process. And I realized, well, if I can do this and I can, I could certainly run for political office. It can't be any harder than working with, with a group of uh, very, um, uh, interested, invested parents, and and it was a, it was good. It was a good grounding. It was such a good grounding at the Agassiz Preschool that five people from that preschool ended up running for office. So it must look like a democratic hotbed. Wow! And when winning, I mean, not just running, they served. <laughs> wow. wow! All in Cambridge or in? The yeah. So uh, yeah. So Craig Kelly was a parent at the Agassiz Preschool. Um, and Nancy Walser, who was on the um, school committee. Luke Schuster was a student there. I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, which you're never supposed to do. Oh, Alistair Kell, who uh, went on the school committee after me because when I knew I was going to city council, I said, Alice, how about you? Why don't you? And she did. So. Oh, that's extraordinary. Yeah. That's extraordinary. It's very so tell me about the, the time on the school committee. I mean, what, 
<clears throat> what were sort of the challenges um, that that the city and and you all faced, and what were sort of your your goals for that? Well, th when I first ran, I um, I ran with MIT and Harvard in mind, and my my um, my stump speech was, "Here we are in uh, Cambridge, a small city with a relatively small school system, between two major institutions, Harvard and MIT." why aren't our schools the best in the country? So that was my stump speech, and that uh, underpinned all that I thought, that our kids deserve to have the best opportunity, all of our kids, and that uh, the benefit of the knowledge that there was in the community um, should uh, devolve to what was going on in our school system. So I, I, um, I actually I became a kind of specialist in a couple of areas on the school committee. One was science education, and um, I worked with a lot of the university folks uh, to develop uh, a better science department for the schools. There was no um, coordinator for the science department, and um, the um, oh gosh, the partnership for public education, which was housed here at MIT. Um, I worked with their staff and officers, um, including um, John Shattuck, who went on to become a famous ambassador, uh, to um, to make sure that we hired somebody to be the coordinator of science education for the Cambridge Public Schools. And that kind of led to really practically everything that went from there, because you couldn't do anything if you didn't have anybody in charge of it. And, you know, I think that was a, I, I'm very proud of that, because I think it was a major step that uh, really s said, we're a science city, our science education should be really good. Um, and get as good as it can get. And it's, it's not perfect now. It certainly wasn't perfect um, in the few years that I was on the school committee, but it, a statement was made. You know, you can't just ignore this problem. And uh, so that, that, that's what I got involved with there. And also on, with health education for kids. Uh, and that continued to be an interest of mine um, on the Almanazan City Council for years and years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what was the answer? I mean, why, why weren't schools, like in many places, probably, why weren't they better, given especially these two great institutions? Well, I mean, the, be having the institutions in the community, I'm sure you know, doesn't mean that what goes on in the schools reflects it at all, you know, and it depended very much on uh, who wanted to open the door and what potential there was for opening the doors between the institutions and the public schools. Um, I think that fundamentally it had to do with Prop 2 and a half, that the um, coordinator positions had been eliminated uh, when they could be, and uh, and that meant there, you know, when NIH or NSF was calling, there was nobody really who answered the call, and uh, and that's what happened actually. That uh, I found out through somebody else that NSF was having a, a conference on urban science education in uh, Cleveland, and um, got myself sent there as a lowly school committee member. And uh, they came up to me from the federal government and said, "Well, who do we call? What do we? Who who can we call to uh, to connect up with the school system?" And uh, and I realized that there, there just really wasn't anybody who was championing science education. And I, as I said, I worked with um, the Partnership for Public Education to make sure there was a champion, and um, in the school system, and that worked out pretty well. Yeah. So did and did you work? With MIT, I mean, did MIT open its doors uh, to the schools in well, some way or other? Or? Um, it, it peripherally, that was going on anyway. Um, not so much, not to the degree that it does now, though. I mean, it's really vastly different now than it was then um, uh, for a lot of different reasons and a lot of a lot of good reasons. And But there's always more. I mean, one of the things that, uh, one of the last things I did uh, as mayor was to write a letter to uh, the president of MIT and say, we really need internships for our kids. We need our kids to have uh, time, times, places where they can work in the summertime, where they can experience science directly. And, uh, and President Reif was very um, uh, welcoming and, and uh, said that that was a good idea. I don't know what actually happened. I hope, I hope uh, that it was able to be followed through upon, but um, that's still this. There's always more, you know, because uh, the challenges that are out there um, for uh, sci with science education are tremendous, you know, with uh, in so many ways. Um, but for us in Cambridge, where all the jobs, so many of the great jobs are in 
Kendall Square and in uh, science and technology and uh, engineering, arts and math, STEAM. Um, we really have to ha work together to make sure that kids have a, a ladder, a, ro a road map, whatever an analogy you want to use, a metaphor, uh, for them to be able to feel very empowered over being able to get jobs in those really important um, uh, fields. It's just those are, those are the jobs. That's what we need to train kids for uh, in so many ways. So uh, that that's uh, continued to be a really important part of what I worked on uh, as an elected official is that connection not just to the universities, but also to the jobs related to science, to STEAM, what they like to call STEAM. <clears throat> right. Um, yeah, and you mentioned sort of the health initiatives, too. Mm -hmm. You can talk a little bit about that. Um, they, um, in 1990, there was a project called the Health of the City uh, that came from the federal government, and um, we deter and from a foundation name of which I'm not remembering right this one, maybe Rockefeller, it eventually became Pew, but um, they, um, we were setting goals for the city to become healthier. And I uh, became at that point the co-chair with David Link, who was at Cambridge Hospital, a uh, pediatrician there was a, of something called the Healthy Children Task Force. And we worked for uh, 20, a good 20 years on um, finding barriers to healthy outcomes for kids and and um, uh, and developing programs to um, to meet those needs we like to say that Michelle Obama called us about her initiative because we didn't sign up because we were already doing it and we had done so many early things on uh, healthy eating and physical activity um, that we're have been a model for the country I think that's great that's great. <clears throat> so, um, so some of this obviously spans much more than your your school committee days. I mean, yes. But, but at some point, you decided to run for city council, I guess. Mm -hmm. And how did that come about? Uh, uh, I, I I remember it as experiencing the same problems coming around again and thinking, oh, I don't want to do these again, <laughs> you know. And uh, I had gone to the Kennedy School um, to get another master's degree. And, you know, part of being at the Kennedy School is kind of looking at yourself and saying, what am I going to do now? And, uh, as a course, as part of a course called To Be a Politician, I kind of looked inside myself and said, yeah, I kind of would like to continue doing this. And the opportunity that came up was on council. Somebody stepped down, uh, somebody who was in my neighborhood. Um, so it made it even more of a natural fit. Uh, so I decided to run and, um, I only like to win when I run because otherwise it's really quite boring. So I was lucky enough uh, and worked hard enough, I should say really, to be elected the first time to city council. And um, that was, the rest was history for another 16 years. <clears throat> with a with a term or more than one, I'm not sure, as mayor in there, right? Is that how that works in, uh, in well, Cambridge? I, I was a vice mayor for... Uh, uh, I was the vice mayor for two terms, and I was the mayor for the last term that I was on the council. Right, right, great. So, yeah, I mean, what, what during that, I mean, that's a huge uh, amount of time that we're talking about, but, I mean, what, what, what were sort of some of the, the, the things that you're most proud of during that time? Well, I'm, I am very proud of the, uh, the Healthy Children Task Force and all the health things that we did. I'm, I'm really proud of, our, our, uh, of the science things that we talked about as well. Uh, I'm quite proud of the environmental record, which we haven't talked about um, yet, but um, one of the things that I did when I got on the council is I became a real champion uh, for, uh, for climate issues, um, and that was started in about the year 2000, and I was able to work um, a lot on things like LEED, making sure the city uh, built only LEED certified buildings, and uh, that... Um, what are some of the other things? Uh, uh, eventually, I should think of all my roster of all those environmental things, but you know, non-auto transportation. And, uh, and by the end, by the time I was completing my service, we were talking about net zero and that buildings could be built so that they would be so energy efficient uh, that they would be able to supply the remaining amount of energy by generation uh, especially good if it was generation on site. So um, uh, toward the end, uh, hmm, say five, six years ago, uh, I proposed that we build the first net zero 
elementary school, which is the King School. Uh, it's just been completed on Putnam Avenue. Unfortunately, or it's almost completed, just a skosh short. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite net zero, but it's net zero ready. And the next school building, which is uh, going to be under, under construction next year uh, on Cambridge Street, will be a net zero building for sure, uh, with a plan to make all succeeding uh, buildings net zero. So this whole net zero concept, this idea of uh, what what are we going to do so that we can uh, uh, get off of carbon and um, uh, save the planet, which shall we sound so dramatic, but really it's very important, um, that uh, we've been doing a lot of things here in Cambridge. I'm very proud of that because we're a model for what other larger cities uh, have done after that. Uh, we kind of do proof of concept here. Uh, so within the Net Zero Task Force, uh, we set a target of reduction, so 80% reduction in carbon by, uh, by 2040. And it seems clear that if we get on that path, we would have 100%, we would be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, so that kind of thing is, you know, a small city of 100,000 with a lot of commercial development can do that and with labs and other things that we have. Then, uh, then we can say to others, look at this, consider this, see if this is something you, Boston, could do. Uh, is this something you, Chicago, could do? And I think that will turn out to be the kind of uh, the place that sort of shows, yeah, this is, there's, this is not uh, something to be afraid of. And, um, and in fact, when the idea first came up and it came from the public, not from me, um, there was a lot of concern, you know, that this was a, one of those crazy ideas from a, uh, an activist community, and um, uh, this will just scare business away. And some of your, some people here at MIT themselves were kind of concerned: Is this going to mean the death of development in the city? And sure enough, when we uh, put this uh, task force together and everybody worked together to really look at the real facts behind it, uh, we determined that if we went carefully, slowly, deliberately, and uh, using a science, science as our base, that we, that we could do this, you know, that we could cut this up into the kind of pieces that would mean that we would be uh, reducing our carbon emissions by a greater and greater amount, um, even while growing at the incredible rate that Cambridge still is growing. So, so I, I'm really proud of that. I'm not, but before that, um, and something that led up to making that uh, possible, I think, was that when I was the mayor, um, I decided to take uh, advantage of the office, the, uh, the ability to concentrate on one important project uh, on climate and to develop something called the Cambridge Compact for a Sustainable Future. Um, I had for a long time and uh, been talking about how universities are a terribly, terribly important part of the en environmental picture in, um, in cities. And uh, uh, I was the chair of the Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Committee at the National League of Cities and at another time the chair of the University Community Caucus. And, and I, I was always trying to say to them, look, you have these universities, they're part of your community, and they can really make a difference. If you work together, uh, then you can really make a difference in these environmental matters. For us here in Cambridge, between Harvard, MIT, and the city, we control 25% of the building stock. And most of our emissions, 80% of our emissions, are from buildings. So if we all work together, we're going to have a tremendous impact uh, on the future of emissions in the city. And that, that was the basis, really, for being able to talk about net zero, is that we understood how important buildings were, how buildings work uh, to some extent, and need to know more. But, uh, but if we all got together and we all did, uh, uh, did the same sorts of things, that we'd be able to make a difference all holding hands. The compact um, started with discussions between Harvard, MIT, and the city, and uh, quickly became uh, the conversation went to, well, it shouldn't just be us. It should include also some of these larger uh, uh, companies that are based here in Cambridge. If we get them on board, uh, then we'll be able to really um, uh, make even more of a difference. And in fact, obviously, when you work with companies that are based here in Cambridge, they they have branches elsewhere too. So if you can make a difference here, you're, you have you can have an impact 
well, worldwide, for heaven's sake, right? Why not? And uh, so, um, so that's what happened is that after about a year and a half, we were able to sign the compact um, with these partners, and they're in the process of, they've hired a part-time person, they're in the process of doing some goal setting. Um, I had to leave it behind when I left office, at least uh, from the point of view of being the leader uh, or the, the, uh, the organizing person. Um, and, uh, but I'm now glad to see that we're still working together. And I think the, um, on, as far as Net Zero went, that was really important. That's who sat at the table with citizens, members of the compact, sat at the table with citizens, sat at the table uh, with um, city people and all together, uh, and experts, and all together we were able to say, yeah, we look at our building stock, we think we can do this. We think if we do it deliberately, carefully, and with a reasonable time frame, we'll be able to knock back uh, the carbon in the city uh, from buildings, and that that will make a huge difference. <clears throat> so the compact was was uh, the city and Harvard and MIT signing on to say we're we're going to do this? We're right. going to try to achieve these goals. Or? Yes. Well, it, it yes, we're going to work together. The goal, but the goals per se, uh, as far as net zero, that was a year later, with the compact working with others to do that. So the, uh, but it was really this idea that we'll we'll march together on buildings. We'll work together on. Uh, I think we had seven things all together on. Um, buildings, uh, vulnerability assessment, um, district energy, all those kinds of things. People have to work together, um, including the city and the institutions and the major businesses, and that, that kind of thing is happening already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you sounds like you, you, you and the city worked closely with MIT during that time, it sounds oh, like. Oh, yeah. That, well, that was a, the, the great thing about being the mayor is you could convene meetings and people would come you know, at a wonderful office and a wonderful staff, and I could say, I have an idea. Why don't you all come in? Let's talk about it. And there was immediately a lot of enthusiasm for working together because we'd already been working together. We, didn't, we just hadn't ever uh, solidified it. We never called it anything. It was just cooperation. But this took it two, three, four steps further um, to create an institution that, um, that will endure, I think, for, uh, for time to come. So when... Uh, when the net zero plan went to the council, the compact said, uh, issued a statement saying, we support this, we think it's really important, we think we should all do this together. And so you have that kind of uh, cooperation and coordination institutionalized rather than ad hoc, you know, and it's really good. It's a good period of time of the university community cooperation here in Cambridge, I think. Really good time. Did you see that? Evolve in the time. Well, it sounds like you did from the simplex days you referred to. I oh mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, maybe you can describe that that evolution uh, or what you what you've witnessed. Well, uh, <laughs> yes, it was. It really uh, it changed a lot. Um, um, I, I think that um, at first it was it was just like the '60s, right? You know, them and us, and uh, the us was the community, and them was uh, were the institutions, and um, and MIT was growing and Harvard, too, growing enormously in the community in terms of land and um, taking away um, uh, biz jobs, taking away whatever. It was just the enemy. It was terrible, actually. It was a, there was this uh, an image of uh, the octopus, the MIT, the octopus, reaching into every neighborhood, and it was, it was uh, kind of creepy, actually. Um, so... Uh, over time, there was a very a more radical group that was confrontational, and then there got to be a more uh, a cooperative group that wanted to work with MIT. And um, and I should mention the name of a good friend, Geneva Malenfant, who was one of the people who worked with Walter Milne here at MIT. And they would talk, you know, and figure things out. And um, they eventually started cooperating around zoning that was being proposed. Um, it was never perfect, you know, especially University Park zoning was really tough, really tough for the neighborhood to see uh, these very intense development go up there. Uh, but it was a far cry from what it would have been if there hadn't been cooperation, particularly about housing. And MIT has always 
had a really good ear about how important housing is in the community, uh, from senior housing that they built in the uh, 70s uh, to um, uh, housing that was proposed for the University Park area. And um, it's all rental. It's not the perfect kind of housing. It's not, but but there were there's a significant amount of subsidized housing in there also, and that came from all these negotiations. Um, so that was that was a good thing, um, but it took a long time. You know, there was a lot of, I mean, you can sort of hear the crackling in the system and the and the. Uh, it was it was pretty uncomfortable, but eventually it got better, and then it it became much more subtle. You know, things like when the uh, the recent the Pacific Street dorm was built, uh, there was and the soccer field, and so the land belonged to the city. Or now, how did it go? I think the land belonged to MIT, and MIT, in exchange for the land, got more development rights for Pacific Street. And I think they began to be a much more sophisticated way of negotiating, you know, what's the community interest and what's the MIT interest, a little at a time. And the sense that it wasn't going to be a walled off institution, that you couldn't turn your back to the community, that there needed to be a knitting together at the edge. Um, at Brookline Street or Sydney Street. I always thought it was Sydney Street, but it turned out it seems to be Brookline Street. Anyway, it's sort of like there was that sort of how do you knit together where the, the, uh, uh, the institution ends and the community begins. And um, that was more, so, more happening here than in East Cambridge, but I think East Cambridge has gotten more into the act lately and with Kendall Square developing. But I'm much more, uh, I, w I was for a long time very familiar with this sort of neighborhood scale, neighborhood level uh, MIT in interaction with the community. Central Square to very, very complicated problems. These are very complicated problems. So when MIT was building uh, in, uh, in Central, purchased, purchased land in Central Square, the land, uh, the uses were more community based. But we meet together. We're just like right on top of each other. It's not, you know, it's not out there in the wilderness with some kind of green campus with a, you know, trees all around it. We're all together here. And so learning how to do that, I think, took a long time. And I think uh, I credit MIT staff with being very patient and um, I work with Sarah Gallup a lot. And Sarah's done a great job. She really, she knows how to talk to people, all kinds of people. And it's made a big difference. It really... Um, there's a real sort of kindness and generosity there that there wasn't at some other times. And um, so, in, and in a way, I think it's helped all our other development, too, because we, we, it's like an institutional uh, education. How do you do this? How do you take these vastly different interests and have them come up with one place? And, uh, and so I, th I think it's, it's worked out pretty well. <clears throat> yeah, and it sounds like uh, one of those things you mentioned, the Pacific Street dormitory, I guess it is, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, it involved uh, some exchange that it created some more open space in the community or something. Is that right? Yep. And maybe there was another one, another place like that, I think. Or well, read, or? At, at, I think as, uh, as I was leaving office, I, I said, you know, you own these three little pieces of land on Brookline Street. Can't you, uh, can't you get them to be back to the community as open space? And so people kind of worked that out and figured out that, you know, MIT was never really going to use you know, a sub-size housing lot, and there were three of them on Brookline Street. And uh, so the little bit of open space got returned to the community. The city hasn't figured out quite what to do with it yet, but uh, at least two of the parcels aren't yet figured out. But, but yeah, I mean, it's it just, I think that's, it speaks to um, uh, a less confrontational way of doing things, and I, th I think that that was, uh, that was very important. Right. So I, I was... Uh I heard some story about, uh, I, I guess, some sort of uh, opening celebration or inaugural celebration for the for the open space. The little, the little, to. yeah. Uh -huh. Something about heaters and stuff. And oh there's yeah. Some story that, that goes along with this. Well, I don't know. I think it was it was uh, more of a um, <laughs> it was it was a big problem for uh, for for MIT staff because they wanted to have this wonderful hoo ha, this wonderful uh, celebration, and uh, uh, it was cold. Maybe it was rainy. It was it was not it was not ideal, but. It, it spoke to um, uh, something I, I haven't spoken of, which is uh, MIT real estate, which is yet another part of what uh, another player, because I don't think it's exactly the same player always, but MIT real estate was developing along Brookline Street, and this was part of 
the leftovers, so to speak, were these were these parcels, and uh, and it was. It sounds like you heard of somebody's trauma with the, uh, <laughs> the opening ceremony. Something. I didn't perceive it that way. Oh. I mean, it wasn't. I, I think it was. Uh, to me, the fact that that parcel is there, connected to more open space that was already there, is the most important part of the of the transaction, the long term rather than the celebratory moment. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it sounded like uh, right. <laughs> There was some story there about heaters disappearing or something. Oh, the heaters know. were stolen. That's right. I heard that. <laughs> the heaters were supposed to be out there, and then the next day there weren't any heaters there anymore. Hmm. So I heard. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <coughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned the, the housing issue. I mean, how, how do you balance that with in a place like Cambridge where it's just booming and there's all these students, and then, you know, you want to maintain a place, a city where where you know, people who can live, you know, who, who aren't fabulously wealthy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. how, how do you balance those interests and how does the city and, and these institutions, how do they work together? Well, um, it's been an, an evolving issue. It's been, I think it's probably most desperate now, more desperate than ever. Although um, so many people who are in the middle class have left, long, are long gone, you know, so you can't protect that anymore too much. Um, real estate values are just, you know, totally crazy here. And um, the, the main thing is it's a, re it's a regional problem. We're short half a million housing units, I think um, Barry Bluestone said. So everybody has to be building housing of different types to uh, relieve the pressure on housing. And um, here we've concentrated for a long time on the most vulnerable people. Uh, being able to live here and stay here, but a lot of that is in public housing, and that's in excellent public housing. Um, in terms of the other housing stock, um, I don't know what the answer is, and just build more, you know. So right now in uh, in Central Square, they're gonna be building, uh, I think, a 270-foot tower that'll have a lot of housing in it uh, with a high proportion of it. I think 15 to 20% is gonna be uh, subsidized, but just got to build housing where it's appropriate. I mean, I don't think you just build it anywhere, but um, you make possible the development of units so that there's not so much pressure. Um, I mean, this it's beyond one city to be able to solve the problem of housing in the greater Boston area. Uh, but we're, I think we're in particular, particularly uh, vulnerable because, I mean, I look at my own block, all the places that have gone up for sale have gone to couples in their 30s, maybe early 40s, and he or she walks to work in Kendall or in University Park, and he or she goes to work in the medical center, and this is it. You know, like couple after couple, same description, and because this is the right place to be for where all the great science is happening, and people want to live here, and the housing stock is nice, so it puts pressure on. I, I don't know what the answer. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I think you have to push more middle income programs, you know, to keep. Um, uh, to keep people who are maybe on the edge staying here and look for creative solutions. I, I was always concerned the school system would become, you know, the rich and the poor. Um, I think to some extent that has happened. Um, but I want this, have always wanted that school system to be an excellent school system for all. And um, it's a... Uh, we have only one high school, and we mix all the kids up together. And I think the the outcome beyond education is uh, uh, says a lot for um, uh, the values of our society. And I, I'm really I want really want to support that always. Yeah, <clears throat> you mentioned the sort of uh, non auto transportation initiatives too. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that and 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 where those wh where would you like to see those go and what role they play in a place like Cambridge? Oh, well, we already are the most walkable city in America, the top biking city. I mean, we're, but it goes to show how much further you need to go, you know, there, that I mean, bicycling is always such, has so many sad stories of uh, people who bike and it's not entirely safe, so there's a lot more work that has to be done about that. Um, but walking is great here, it really is. I mean, I walked here, um, and I uh, take public transportation wherever I go. I, uh, we're, 
We've had a wonderful city staff that's worked on this since uh, for a long time. Actually, I was a transportation planner back when I was working for the city for part of the time. Um, but uh, we were under court order from the federal government in the, starting in the 90s around the Clean Air Act to decrease the use of uh, single car automobiles. And so we have a plethora of programs to discourage people from, <laughs> from dri driving here and parking here. It's always humorous just because everybody only wants to talk to me about parking and <laughs> traffic. And, but, you know, they also, uh, in terms of what they're complaining about now, but um, but I think the it's a great walkable city. It's great to get around here, and you know, there's uh, you just have to keep at it, keep it safe, especially make sure the construction sites have sidewalks, things like that. You know, yeah, really yeah. important. Plenty of construction sites these yeah, that's days. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> I think um, sort of uh, when when you were. In the mayor's office, you know, we, we, we all experienced this, this horrible tragedy of the marathon bombing mm, and then yes. the, 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 the murder of Sean Collier and mm -hmm. the extraordinary um, uh, uh, things that came out of that, the, 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 the ceremony and everything, the mm -hmm. uh, memorial. I'm sort of wondering if you can talk about, you know, what, what was that time like uh, to be the mayor of Cambridge? I mean, um, it, I think it was, a, of course, it was a very hard time for all of us. And... Um, um, we're a small city, and um, and we knew, so many of us knew victims and the, the, the perpetrators, too. You know, they were products of the school system. So it was a very, the community was very torn up, you know, in so many different ways. And the, um, um, I know personally three people who were um, hit by shrapnel and harmed and um, we just were, were a city in kind of under siege for a while, and, um, a lot of mixed emotions. I think that the role of the mayor at that time, more than anything, was to be kind of a minister to the community, you know, to um, make sure that people knew that they were safe and that they were together and they were held uh, in a way. Um, uh, it was uh, really important to show that we were together you know, went together with MIT, um, that we were uh, cognizant of what the great loss there was here and a great sense of uh, uh, loss of safety that people felt overall. Um, it's a very confusing thing to have happen. Um, I mean, it just, where does this all come from? Where does this, how did this begin? But it was very, it's hard being uh, in the city government because of the press the press was everywhere. That was part of the hardest thing of all. Uh, not the hardest of the things that happened after. But um, I don't know. I think, uh, I suppose we learned some things, but it's still, it's, it's just terribly sad. I mean, more than anything, it's just terribly sad to think that uh, young men who had been like so many other kids were and no different, apparently, were somehow had these crazy ideas in their head and uh, went on to harm people who were close to them, who had, you know, very nearly helped them personally. And it just didn't make any sense at all. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's hopefully uh, something we never revisit, so. Um, um, The um, I mean, in in 2016, you know, MIT is celebrating 100 years uh -huh. in, in Cambridge, and yep. uh, I'm sort of wondering, you know, what if you have thoughts about that? I mean, you know, what what uh, <laughs> I don't know, what's the significance? Uh, do you think of of that for for you or for the city or for MIT or? You know? Well, I think the um, uh, MIT owns about 10 percent of the real estate in the city. I mean, MIT is not just an important worldwide institution doing, you know, curing cancer, solving the world's problems. Um, but it's also, uh, for us, a big physical part of the city. And I think that we're, I was thinking of this on the way over here, that we're in a relatively good place that as a result of the former city manager, Bob Healy, negotiating something uh, that, d that required MIT not to sell off too much of its property at once depriving us of tax base, we're in a better place than we were 
many years ago. And some of the, uh, the, the tension around all this property ownership is come somewhat abated. So there's that, but there also has been the, you know, the multi-million dollar development that's going to be multi-million square foot development that's going to go up in Kendall Square. And that's, so the mystery of that is a little, has been somewhat solved. We know what's going to be happening. I, I think that the, um, uh, from an institution sort of based on Mass Ave, that there's a sense that the uh, the Kendall Square portal for the university uh, will become more important when all this uh, gets done. Um, I think that I think that the um, the evolution of the institution is is great um, has come come quite a, quite a ways in the past hundred years in Cambridge. Um, in some ways, you could start the whole thing again, saying from this little bit. Suddenly, there's this huge uh, institution with many, many buildings and many, many important things happening. But I look at it from the point of view of the process. You know, how are, how are we in the process? Are we uh, are we able to live together? Are we able to both have a city and have a giant international institution in our midst and have it work for everyone? I think I think we're getting there, and I think that's terribly important. Um, MIT has been. Um, so important for the community in terms of economic development and the hundreds of small and large um, companies that have gotten started here um, have really made uh, a lot of difference for us in terms of our cachet, our tax base for all those companies as well. Uh, I would like to see more of it devolve back again to our young people. Um, and I think that that's a struggle. It's not, it's not easy. Um, means things like internships, but it means other things as well, and a serious um, cooperation between the schools and the um, and the and the city and and the school, the schools and the inst and MIT, and you know that's as much from the schools as it is from MIT to really make that happen, to really become committed to that. I think that's the challenge. You know, it's the same thing as what I ran for office on. I mean, are we gonna are we gonna be in the city with all these? riches in terms of intellectual and, uh, and institutional riches, and is that going to mean a lot for our kids? I mean, that, to me, is what it's really all about. That's what makes, will make Cambridge the, the best possible city it can be, is everybody gets to share. Maybe I'm a socialist, I don't know. <laughs> so the, the, you, you mentioned the, <clears throat> the Kendall Square initiative, mm -hmm. and um, I'm sort of wondering, I mean, what do you think the, the impact of that will be uh, on, on Cambridge and, and the people who live here. And well, we had many conversations at the council about this when the project came in, and um, uh, and I think several of us were really concerned about what does it mean for the square, you know. And I think we envisioned, you know, world class subway stations where squares around them were full of excitement and uh, nightlife and all the rest of that, and. Um, I hope that that's what it means. I hope it means that Kendall Square becomes another great square, not a place where there's one hotel and a bookstore and you know students going off to food trucks. Not just that, that it really uh, has a real retail liveliness and, uh, uh, and tells the message about what excitement there is around it. So I'm hoping that that development uh, leads to that there. I'm less concerned about some of the other things, although I want to make sure that the connection to the river is there. I think that's really important. Um, I, uh, I really, I just want Kendall Square to be a place where you don't say, where is Kendall Square? Which is where people, they, they come out of the, they come out of the subway and they say, where's Kendall Square? And well, they're, they're there already, but you know, uh, you can't tell that you're at Kendall Square. So I want you to know that you're really there and that it's a great place and MIT is an exciting place. And you know, I, I have ideas that uh, uh, I think we all did for things that should happen there that probably won't, but I thought that'd be a great place for the MIT Science, the Science Museum, MIT Museum, which has all that science in it. You know, you get out and you find out right away, here's what's happening here. Here's an explanation for what is MIT and how to get from here to there and what you, why you want to be hanging around here. So uh, that's my hope. My hope is it gets to be like that kind of world-class place. Um, and, 
It's interesting also that the Department of Transportation has 18 acres across the street that's just getting developed as well. And, uh, and how is that all going to happen? Are we going to continue to charade that we're a suburban office park or are we going to be urban? And we're going to, you know, make, make the most of what that uh, urban environment uh, uh, could be, you know, and following in the following what I learned from Kevin Lynch so many years ago at MIT. Is it going to be that kind of a place? So. This is the, um, the, the Volpe Transportation yeah. and former NASA site, mm -hmm. I guess. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That place is really spooky right now. It has cars parked there from the, I don't know, maybe from Mars, but they're, <laughs> they're all covered with dust and these old, ve old Department of Transportation vehicles, a sea of parking and one little building that they developed for NASA. So, um, well, they developed for the Department of Transportation when it was supposed to be NASA. And uh, so that will all probably come to play. I, I, and more connectivity, there'll be more connectivity into the square, more, um, more retail, more housing, more of everything. So it should be, it should be pretty exciting uh, when it all comes to pass. And it seems like things are going along on a pretty good direction. But there was a lot of, a lot of talk, you know, the community talked for years and years about what they wanted to see and, and MIT did and now the Department of Transportation is talking about what they need and it all comes together as one vision um, of what a place would be that's called Kendall Square, not just a subway stop. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as a, as a former city planner and, mm -hmm. and with all your various experience, I mean, how do you take a place that has been sort of this no man's land and make it not that i mean what what are the ingredients and and make it also continue to be this 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 innovation ecosystem that it's become well i think it, it starts with um the how you view the connectivity and the and the bones of the area uh, um more than um, i actually had gone to an i guess it's ai it was an aia conference of mayors on architectural problems, and I brought that problem with me to that meeting. It was just a, about a dozen mayors, and, um, you know, they dug into what should Atlantic City do, and what should Philadelphia do, and what should, and when they looked at this, this, this site, they just basically, the architects who were consulting said, just make sure you put the roadways in right. You know, make sure it connects from here to there, that the blocks aren't too big, um, that you don't make cut it off from the central action that you make it work together and I think that that's you know that's the fundamental thing the Kevin Lynch thing was nodes where you need to have these connections to the nodes and figure out how you how you make them work together I think University Park has not been a great success I mean that because of that it doesn't have that kind of feeling about it it's just it's like a, a very tight suburban office office park um, I mean, it works probably for the building by building, but as a place, it's not a nice place, um, especially when you get back away from Mass Ave. And I think Kendall has the the possibility of becoming a nice place, but it has to do with these roads and these blocks and how big are they and what are the faces and, you know, do people come outside or do they go right into parking garages and never see the light of day? I mean, that that's obviously a bad idea. You know, when, when they come out of their building, they don't come out of the building ever, then nothing ever happens on the street. So um, the transportation is important too, but we got a good start there. In the long run, they're going to have to fix that station and that head house. And, you know, you know what that's like. Transportation projects cost so much money and there's so little money devoted to them. Something's going to have to happen with that. <clears throat> yeah, that's a problem Boston's struggling with uh, these days, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so after after serving as mayor, you you decided uh, you were going to move on and do something else. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that decision and what you've been doing since. Uh. Well, I I've been on I was on council for I sometimes 26, 26 years I think and um, no council and school committee for twenty six years and I I felt like that was. That was about enough, and I um, I had always wanted to be doing some other things, and my husband is semi-retired, and uh, so I thought, well, this is a good time to to make a break. And frankly, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with that, except I knew I wanted to do some artworks, which I have been doing, and that I had grandchildren, which that 
predated my decision. And, uh, and I'm still working doing advocacy on environmental matters and uh, working as a sort of policy consultant on things like that. So uh, it's, it's a process, though, figuring out what to do when you retire. And, uh, and I think of it as retiring. But I struggled with that because I don't really want to not work. I'm just, I'm not cut out for not working at all. I'm just not that kind of person. So I have to do some work and some other, and I'm, you know, open to suggestions, I guess you could say. Still it's very, still very interested in the, um, especially in the environmental issues. Right, so you, um, you, you're involved in one, uh, I guess, conference, the SOLVE conference that's coming up at yeah. MIT, which, uh, uh, I mean, is that an example of sort of the kinds of things? Maybe you can tell us about that, but is that sort of an example of the kind of direction you're, you're heading? Or, or? Well, I, I, um, I'm on the board of something called the Institute for Market Transformation, uh, which is a, um, a spin-off from NRDC that has to do with building energy efficiency. And um, I, um, that group is doing really important work on energy efficiency in major cities across the country. And that's something that I'm putting some effort into. Uh, I'm also currently on a coordinating council in the run-up to the Paris climate talks. It's just a little bit of a, a involvement sort of t telling, talking about with the city perspective. This is a very exciting time uh, for the climate talks, and I, I a little bit regret that I am not still the mayor. For that, I think that's probably the only reason I wish, I really wish I was still the mayor, because now they're doing all these terrific things, uh, uh, and going to the Vatican and meeting with the Chinese delegation, and uh, cities are really leading the way um, to show that w even without the federal government doing uh, what it should do, what Congress should permit that uh, cities have a lot of power on their own to control their environments and to control their emissions. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to help that along. And um, it's pretty exciting, though. The uh, friends of mine are, you know, we're at the Vatican, and now they're meeting with a Chinese delegation in California, and they'll be in New York, and they'll be in Paris. And uh, yeah, so I have some regrets about that. I wish I were, I wish I were there, too, but I'm certainly watching on the sidelines feeling very proud of what we did here in Cambridge that uh, gave people the idea that they could do it too. And, uh, and that's, that's certainly what the role has been. So my continuing role, I'm not really sure. You know, I'm, I'm kind of look, casting about for how uh, I can keep being helpful in that area. And I find myself saying that, like, I want to be helpful. And I guess I do. I mean, I guess that's really what motivates me is uh, to be able to um, to see the process go forward. And I, I think that our net zero um, uh, plan here in Cambridge is something that needs to be shared, so that maybe something I work with that. I'm working a little bit with the uh, the group Mothers Out Front, which is an advocacy, advocacy group on climate that's got started here in Cambridge by, um, uh, by some Cambridge people. So I'm doing a little here and a little there, and, and I learned to draw in the last year, which was pretty exciting because I never thought I could do that, and I, and I can. So that's fun. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, what I mean, if you look, if you look ahead, I mean, you know, uh, MIT doesn't seem to me to often kind of pause and look backwards. So you know, <laughs> uh -huh. this centenary celebration is a bit of a time to do that. But I mean, also looking, you know, towards the next century. I mean. What do you see as sort of the, the great opportunities or challenges that Cambridge and MIT, you know, might face? Uh, well, well, I think the the um, I think about these refugees now, and uh, at this point, there are what half a million refugees, um, in coming from war torn parts of the world, uh, converging on Europe, and I think that that's true now, but it would be true in the future as well, and how we're able to assimilate uh, these many peoples into our society. I think that that's going to be one of the critical things to be working on. Um, so looking at how does, what's the role for MIT in that, I think about um, uh, all these kind of digital learning experiences and figuring out how to get that right, you know, because I don't think, you know, people sitting who are 
desperate about where they're going to live are going to want to sit in front of a computer screen suddenly. But so that I think that's a, the problem of how to accommodate all those folks is a critical problem that needs to be solved and that there must be a role for a place like MIT in, in um, uh, ameliorating the situation for these people. Uh, I'm not sure what it is yet, but I know that the creativity of a place like this is, um, uh, would be put to use for that. Uh, certainly around water, clean water. Clean water is going to be, um, continue to be a really important problem. And, um, uh, and, if, and the climate issue is going to be underneath a lot of other problems that come up. And some say this refugee issue is just the first of those because of the refugees in um, Iraq who were fleeing from drought and, you know, where did they go? Where could they go? So I see the institution having a role to play in that. Um, so I think, and there'll always be things that people are thinking of here that we never thought of before, right? Who thought of cell phones? I never knew, you know. <laughs> I would never have thought that I would be so reliant on my iPhone. Never imagined such a thing. Um, so I can't really foresee um, exactly what those other kinds of things are, but um, I, term, I think in terms of physically as being part of the city, I think some of the key issues have been played out. Um, it'll always be very important to balance what's city and what's university and not have universities overwhelming uh, the city and the residential neighborhoods. And as soon as that becomes threatened, you'll have, there'll be trouble again, you know, but I think right now we're in a, a pretty good static place where neighborhoods feel they're safe um, and that they're not about to be swallowed up um, by Harvard or MIT. Um, that being said, I do live on the street where one end is, it's only a five block street, one end is Harvard and the other block, the other end is MIT. So. It could, you could see it happen. You could see the universities kind of come down Mass Ave, say, as well as Chestnut Street, where I live, and, and kind of take over more. I don't think that would be, I, I, I don't think that, that would be good. I don't think you'd want to lose the sense that you're in a real place and not just a university enclave. Um, and what that means, though, is that the university, that MIT, has to be a player and some social issues as well as the, as the physical issues to make it all work, uh, work right, to give opportunity to the kids who live here to, um, and, and I think um, to facilitate some of the adult education that's needed for some of those who have a harder time finding jobs. I think that's, I would love to see that happen. All right, great. Well, I mean, there's, a, there's so much one could talk about. Are there <laughs> other things that occur to you that, you know, uh, we might, we let's might, see, what did we uh, talk about? We talked about housing, we talked about environment, schools. Um, development. Yeah. Development, yeah, those are, those are a lot of the, of the key points. Um, but, you know, just on a, a overall, I think it's just very exciting to have MIT in the community. And, you know, something like the SOLVE conference uh, uh, makes it very clear that this is a, a hub of activity, a hub of creativity and uh, all the little companies that have been spun off. I mean, how exciting is that? How great is it that there's an innovation center in, uh, in Kendall Square and that so many bright ideas are uh, being deployed from here, from our little city uh, out to the rest of the world. I find that terribly exciting. And um, I, I applaud MIT for that. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you for speaking with us. Oh, you're very welcome. It's, it's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you.